Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to the Know Your Gear podcast, episode number 253. I hope you guys had a fantastic week. Um, and uh, I, I think I did too. <laughs> I think I had a fantastic week, so it's always it's always good if I can say that. And um, uh, if you're new to the show, I want to thank you for joining. Also, if you want to get a subject or question to me, you can start with a question mark first, so I know you're directing it towards me. And uh, you can also become a channel member, Super Chats, all those things. I try to grab as many of the questions as I can. Each episode that I find is interesting or that seems like you guys are really reacting to. Also, more importantly, uh, I try to grab the questions that come early uh, when I post the show because, hey, um, you know, I appreciate you guys doing that. And plus, I feel like it's a good way if somebody wants to use a little of their effort <laughs> more than anything else, they can get it, uh, you know, whatever subject they're interested on in the show. And uh, what else? That's it. That's it. If you're watching the rebroadcast, I timestamp all the things. Today's timestamps will be a little slow because today is my wife's birthday. And so after the show, I'm going to take her to uh, dinner. Nothing fancy, but something to get, just get out of the house, have some fun. Um, so let's hit some early questions. Let's get into it. Let's get right into it. And what is it? <laughs> First question or subject should be, is from, should be, and is from. Adrian, who says, hey, Phil, I have owned, oh, no, he wants to know, have I ever owned a fan fret guitar? What do you think of them? Would you recommend? I have uh, worked on many fan fret guitars, um, especially the eight string ones, because he, unless he, even the expensive ones like the Strandbergs have had a lot of issues where you have to crown and level them. Um, so I've crowned and leveled quite a few fan fret guitars. Now, keep in mind, I'm not saying because of the fan fret they needed to be crowned and leveled. It was just usually because when you're dealing with seven, especially eight string guitars in a dry climate like Arizona, sometimes the uh, frets have an issue and uh, they have to be addressed. So that being said, I've played a few of those. Um, I, I've played a uh, fan fret six string guitar uh, that a customer brought in about two years ago, maybe three years ago, and I enjoyed that. I have never owned one. And uh, I made a miscalculation on getting one. And the reason uh, was, was, uh, I think I told you about this. When I went to the 2020 NAM, the guys at Tajima grabbed me and said, hey, I mean, they physically grabbed me. <laughs> they were like, hey, uh, the, you know, like, hey, we, we saw the videos you did on your channel about our, our guitars. Would you like to do any others? And, um, and uh, the answer was yes. I said, absolutely. I, I really like your brand. And I did some videos with Marty Swartz on his channel. I did some videos on my channel where I bought some. And uh, I was very interested in them. And then around that time, I was doing a, a order with Kiesel. And I was going to order a Kiesel fan fret guitar. And the opportunity was, for me, was uh, Tajima said, you know, what would you like to do on the channel? And I said, I would like to... Uh, do one of your fan fret guitars because they had a fan fret guitar. I think it made in in uh, Brazil for like seven hundred dollars, six seven hundred dollars. Of course, is at that time, and uh, very excited about that. So I decided to go a different way. That's when I went with the uh, single cut bevel on the uh, uh, Kiesel guitar, and I didn't pick a fan fret. I kind of regret it now, especially if I knew how it was going to unfold. Obviously, with COVID coming and the problems coming, uh, basically Tajima was never able to fulfill that. Uh, that guitar, they sent something else. That's when they sent that Tele style guitar instead. And um, so I will say this, if I ever order another Kiesel, I say F ever, because I think my next Kiesel that I order will probably be a bass. But if I was to order another Kiesel guitar, it would definitely be a fan fret. And other than that, uh, like I said, I've talked about Strandbergs for many years here about buying one. And uh, so, you know, I actually went uh, down to uh, Rainbow Guitars in Tucson, Arizona with my friend in, in uh, December, and we tried some Strandberg guitars. I just couldn't find one I was bonding with. So, and uh, there you go. I think I just want the fan fret guitar for not so much the extended range 7, 8 string, but a 6 string. But So, to answer your question, no, I, I have played them. They are interesting to me. There are things I like. There are things that I'm not sure about because I've never had one long enough to really digest it. And on the channel, I try not to do a whole lot of the whole, hey, this is a guitar. <laughs> and then that's the experience that I can share with you. I try to uh, share more in-depth experience. Uh, Greg wants to know, what is a fan for a guitar? A fan for a guitar is essentially a guitar 
where the frets, it's not even so much the fan, the frets look like a fan, like a fan, you know, like a fan you fan your face with. Um, but they're fanned out, but they're fanned out because the scale is different. So on the low string, like on a typical guitar, you might see something like a 27 inch scale on the low E, uh, e string or even the B string if it's an ex you know, extended range guitar, and then you'll see a 25 and a half inch scale. So it's a little longer. So that way the bigger strings get more tension because they're longer scale and the shorter string st strings get less tension. It's supposed to make it like a perfect style guitar. What I can tell you is if you're into that concept, that's what basically, uh, 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 you know, strings are that are uh, adjusted. So in other words, so you could essentially, if you could simulate this, if you wanted to do a six string guitar and simulate what a fan fret six string guitar, you know, scale would be, you could do a 48 gauge string and then a 10, you know, 10 to 48 versus 10 to 46. There's a way you can just go through and pick different gauges of strings. It'll give you somewhat the same effect. It's not a hundred percent there, but it gets you really close. So um, that's the main, main thing. So yeah, uh, high deserts, who dad, high desert, who said also called multi-scale. Absolutely. They, um, so that's basically what's going on there. Okay. We, the next one, <laughs> I don't know why I'm just saying other words. Joe, what does Joe want to know? He says, Hey Phil, seeing a lot of ads for the beat buddy pedal. I hate trying to figure out drum machines and this seems like easy solution, uh, thoughts. I, I I did a review of the Beat Buddy, the the bigger one, and I did not like it. I reviewed it in 2016. It was one of the first videos I ever did on the channel. So I don't know if it's the same. I don't know if they've done firmware updates. My main critique of it was it always did a drum intro, and I did not like that feature. That was something I was really not excited about. They made a Beat Buddy Junior. I don't know if it's called Junior or Baby or Mini, Beat Buddy Mini. And that one seems like a better product to me. And what I mean by that is if I was to ever look at getting a Beat Buddy again, it would be the Mini, but I have no intentions of getting one. That would be, that would have to be like if the patrons suggest that as, you know, a product of the month kind of thing. And I would, you know, then I would buy one for the channel. Um, <laughs> I'm going back to the screen. Okay. Uh, the next one's from Michael who says, Hey, Phil, just wanted to thank you for your restring videos. I have put new strings on six of my guitars. Thanks to you. I saved a bunch of money. So again, thanks uh, for the knowledge. Thank you for the compliment. I appreciate that. And, uh, and, uh, I'm glad uh, you got use out of the videos for sure. Kevin wants to know, Hey, I recently set up a friend's brand new made in Mexico Strat and it had some fret sprout. That's because Right now, it feels like almost every Fender coming out of Mexico has fret sprout. Um, I I have not seen it so bad ever. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just because they're heavy production, heavy demand, uh, you know, obviously supply chain issues. It seems like they're doing something I've even never seen before. And I just addressed this with two guitars recently. And I have to say they were really, really shocking because I've only seen it one or two times and then to see it two times in a row on the same type of guitar, which is the the fret the fretboard shrinking, you know, which is what it does. That's what's happened with fret sprout, right? The the frets are cut to the width of the fretboard, the fretboard shrinks, so and the neck shrinks. The frets don't shrink, so they stick out. We say sprout, but really they're just they didn't move. <laughs> but these ones did it so bad that you could actually see in between the frets like a where a concaves in like it was so like aggressive, right? Almost like a sponge drying out and you know, a sponge like <laughs> misshapens after you wet it and then it kind of dries up and it's not flat in the same shape anymore. That's what it looked like. So very, very, very extreme. Now keep in mind, these are both obviously guitars I, I, I seen in Arizona. So obviously it's a dry climate on top of that. So you might not be seeing the extreme problem as much as we are here, but uh, it's really bad. It's the worst I've ever seen it. And I really think it's because, again, they're getting wood. The wood supply chain is probably tough. They get in the wood. They're not sitting on it very long. They're, you know, drying as fast as they can, and they're just building guitars. The joke is, you know, uh, it's, it's a guitar neck that does. It's the wood on the guitar neck doesn't even know it's dead yet. That's how. That's how recent it's been cut down. So that's probably what's going on with that. Um, but his main question is on his main Mexico Strat. He's got fret sprout is horrible. Yes, I've seen it. Does living in the desert, uh, Gilbert, Arizona, make it worse? Absolutely. <laughs> this is 
Absolutely. Some of the best, some of the worst places for uh, dryness, of course, in the United States are going to be like Arizona, New Mexico, part of California, Colorado. I mean, it's just wherever it's dry. Um, it can happen in other places in the in 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 the uh, United States artificially. In other words, because you know you have uh, it's so cold, you run heaters a lot, and they're drying out the air. Now, keep in mind, I'm not versed in that. I've never lived where it's really cold, and I've never done repairs in the cold. So it is a different different uh, set of issues I deal with here in a dry climate. Um, what I t- what I can tell you is yes, it has to be. Uh, so much so that I would almost recommend that you uh, humidify the guitar in a case, put a humi- some humidity packs in there, put it in the case before you do the fret sprout, and then maybe even after you do the fret sprout. That might be the case. I would uh, I would definitely consider. Um, Okay, this next one's come from Matt. These are all still the early uh, comment sections. Um, Matt says, hey, Phil, recently on another channel talked about, uh, it says Y tiers. I'm going to say it's YouTubers, about YouTubers and uh, who companies, oh, no, the naughty list. Okay, so the naughty list. Uh, he says, and who companies put on the naughty list? The comments were gold. Uh, if you're on the naughty list, <laughs> don't ever be nice. Keep it good work. Uh, obviously, Matt, that was Casino Guitars. They did a subject uh, video this week, the Naughty Nice List. Um, I, of course, woke up, I want to say Wednesday? I don't know. I woke up to the, uh, excuse me, to the emails and texts <laughs> from buddies. Hey, did you see you made the Naughty List? Or, hey, did you see they're talking about? And and it was uh, it was a really good subject video. Of course, I've mentioned Casino Guitars before. Um they have a great uh, YouTube channel where they talk about all kinds of subjects and they have a lot of industry experience and, uh, and, and it's a good channel. That's why I've mentioned them in the past. This particular one, they were talking about um, YouTubers essentially getting on, uh, they were calling it the naughty list. Obviously, I think they were trying to be like my channel, trying to give you information, try to be, you know, give it to you straight, but maybe not, you know, maybe not like dose you so hard with the, the negativity. And, um, and uh, and anyway, so in this, they were discussing channels that get basically uh, n- on the naughty list. In other words, companies don't want to work with them because of of maybe they were too honest, or maybe they're the content they're making isn't making the companies happy. And so they uh, talked about. It. They mentioned uh, my channel. They mentioned Paul David's channel. And uh, but I will tell you. Let me give you some insight. I'll, I'll tell you what I think about being on the naughty list, or at least insinu- that insinuation. But I want to tell you something that a lot of you probably aren't going to catch that they were really was really impressive in that video. I have to I have to say I was very impressed when I watched it. There's a section in the video where they don't. It's not talking about YouTubers who are honest. They were and YouTubers that are dishonest are the deals that go behind the scenes, as we talk about on the podcast. Like I said each week. But the, I don't want to say fake, because that's a little too harsh of a word. I don't, not because I'm not trying to upset anybody. It's just, does it's not that, uh, that so intense. But it's a little of, uh, I guess the best way to put it is they were talking about YouTubers using phrases and techniques to imply negativity that's not negative. And I want to give you an example of that, okay? Uh, and like I said, and please go, bear with me, you can watch their video and they'll they'll uh, they'll discuss it better, especially the section, but I want you to pay attention. They were talking about YouTube channels, not only saying harsh things and not saying harsh things, always, you know, just giving everybody a pass and saying, hey, everything's great. They were talking about the subtlety in the YouTubers uh, channels that try to say that, you know, uh, something that's you know, probably be harsh and negative and to the point and honest and brutal, but essentially not saying anything. And and I have an analogy that works great for this. If we were movie critics, wouldn't it be funny if you would notice it more than you would notice on, you know, a guitar channel? If uh, somebody said, oh, the movie's great. It's amazing. The acting is great. But the credits at the end were just too long for me. You know what I mean? And they're like, well, at least he's honest. <laughs> but why that wouldn't land with a company is no movie company would care that you said that. And what they were talking about that I want to elaborate on a little bit for a second is that it's not, it's, there is a technique and I have seen it. That's what they said. They said, I've seen a technique. They're noticing it. I've noticed it too, where a channel highlights something that doesn't matter at all. And, um, and it's really interesting. And I don't know if that's why I'm saying, I don't want to say it's fake because it could be just, Maybe that's what that really mattered to them, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> but maybe it is a little phony. And for example of that is, uh, is you know the problem with the guitar is it's just too good, <laughs> right? You're like, well, that's not really a, a critique of anything, is it? So, um, and the reason I point that out is I've I've said this for years on this podcast, as like obviously because I feel like I have dual lives on the internet. I have this podcast show which is totally funded by patrons, funded by you, no companies involved, no 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 agenda. Which it has this channel, this show has absolutely pissed off companies to no end. <laughs> and I've learned to balance it. And that's what they talked about in that video too, is about the balance you have to do. You have to do some kind of balance, right? You can't make enemies with everybody. But what's interesting is, is uh, this is what I thought was really kind of funny, is a lot of you still, um, I don't think, grasp this. And I, it's why I want to reiterate it over and over again. Every time I've ever had a company really pissed at me or really upset with me, they didn't provide me anything. It was something I purchased. I did a video independently. And so I usually have a very, uh, <laughs> I change gears, so you know. Um, I, uh, I, I, I don't know how to convey it in this format because <laughs> cause, uh, I think you guys always see me as happy-go-lucky and I'm kind of smiling on the show because it's a positive show. We're trying to keep it fun here. But I do have a temper and it will trigger fast and it usually is that. It's like if I've spent my money to do something and I've given the honest truth and I feel like I've done everything that I can with integrity, and then some companies lighten me up over it, I usually don't handle it very well. Cause not because I don't wanna listen to what they have to say, I think it has value too, but I'm like, right, come on, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like I said, a lot of times when you piss off the companies, it has nothing to do with they sent you a piece of gear. You just piss them off with, uh, and this is the last point, and I'll get off the subject cause it's getting a little old. Um, it's not companies you piss off, it's people at companies. Actually, I, since the part of the gig on this show is I tell you funny stories, I'll tell you a funny story with a company and uh, that really happened. And I'm going to do a whole, you know, sadly enough, I'm not going to say what company has to save, but here it doesn't matter. The company is not important to the story. What's important to the story was in 2019, I was at the summer NAM, and um, I, uh, <laughs> I was working as I do, right, at the, at the NAM shows, like all the channels do. I was taking video of stuff and doing stuff. And a YouTuber... A couple YouTubers channels, other channels, uh, alike size channels of mine were hanging out and they said, oh, we're going to go to a dinner. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, well, I'll see you guys tomorrow. And they go, no, no, you should come with. They've invited like every YouTuber. Now, so you guys know, this isn't Gibson because I know I did in 2019, I have a podcast where I talk about how I crashed the Gibson party, but that's, that was not the same night, but not that thing. And so here's why this is funny. And so they go, oh, this is the company hosting it. And I go, oh yeah, they hate me. And they go, why do they hate you? And I go, mm. I go, um, I, uh, they showed me a guitar. So I would like to point out, they hate me not because I did a video, not because they said anything on the podcast. At their booth a year or two prior, they showed me a guitar. And this is what happened. This is what set them off. So, you know, I, I'll just give you the actual what. Um, I was going booth to booth as I do. And I was really, you know, interacting with the companies as I do. And every company was starting to get a little... <laughs> carbon copy-ish where they're like oh here's a new finish we're doing nobody has this it's a new exclusive finish that our paint supplier provided for us and I was like wow it's really cool and I went to the next booth you know not next door but you know you go into the next booth and this other company goes we have a new color it was the same color and I go it's like exclusive to us this year we're putting it on the catalog no one has it only our painters can do it and only our paint suppliers got it and I go oh interesting and so then I went to another booth and exactly that. They're like, hey, this is our new color. <laughs> and, um, and, I, and I don't know why. Sometimes, you know, I try to t say everything with some, some, some business etiquette and kindness, but I don't know what happened in this particular case. When he shows me the color uh, and he says it's exclusive to their paint manufacturer, I said, yeah, I'm hearing this story a lot today. I think there's a salesman at this paint manufacturer that's conning all you guys and telling you everyone has this color. And instead of reacting to, are you serious? Oh my goodness. He went, no, they don't. And I said, no, no. Uh, I'll just say, Kiesel has the color. I was like, we're going down the list of the companies that already showed me this color. And I go, they have the color. They have the color. <laughs> right? Everybody has this color. And um, he was uh, very upset. So... Um, I knew that he was upset. I knew that it seemed like I was the messenger of bad news. 
And so what I thought I would do is just go, uh, oh, but the guitar looks great. I mean, that's really cool. Let's talk about that. So I'm like learning to sidestep. And so as we go to the guitar, he's telling me the price tag, which is a very expensive guitar, thousands and thousands of dollars. And then he says, oh, and we use a JB and a jazz pickup. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I go, do you make your own pickups? Have you thought about using your own pickups? And he's like, well, obviously Seymour Duncan makes great pickups. And I go, well, yeah, of course they do. But like I can buy a $300 guitar with JB and jazz. <laughs> See, I'm 0 for 2 on this, right? So long story short, uh, uh, he didn't say anything that made me think they hated me. J something happened over time that definitely seemed like they weren't um, happy. So why the story is funny is fast forward 2019. I'm with these YouTubers. They say, come to this dinner. Uh, I tell them, no, that company does not like me. And they said, no, no, I have a plus one. The other channel's like, I have a plus one. You can come with us. Come hang out with us. It'll be fun. And I go, everybody's trying to guess. It's Pierce. It's just a company. It's a small company. So this is why it's just kind of funny. So <laughs> I go to this uh, uh, event, dinner. It's really just a dinner event. And I'm standing there, and it's in a bar section. And, uh, you know, I'm, I see the owners. I talk to the people that, you know, the company. And I'm just, you know, like, hey. And, and the YouTubers that are with me are like, hey, Phil McKnight's here. And they're like, oh, interesting. And it's not like a pleasant experience. Like you can tell, like, I'm not supposed to be there. And so we're sitting at the table and uh, <laughs> we're sitting at the table and uh, we're talking. And then basically the company that's talking to the other YouTube channels, um, they make a really co interesting comment about, hey, uh, Phil McKnight uh, doesn't like our stuff and now we're buying him a dinner. <laughs> And uh, so long story short, the reason I tell you the story is not that the story is that interesting. It's to give you an idea of how people, not companies, can interact. And so I, that's why I'm saying, I, I think of this, the reason why I don't, there's a reason why I don't want to mention the company. It's not because I don't want to shame the company. The person that was upset with me is no longer there because companies churn people. So they're not there. And I don't know if the other people there were there that night or even there either. So I wouldn't even know, you know what I mean? And that's what I'm trying to say. When I, when YouTube channels or somebody's talking about companies, you can understand it's people. Sometimes you don't get along with people. I once upset a company, uh, <laughs> actually this is within the last two years, uh, through a, they reached out to me, we're talking, they were asking about getting guitars in the channel. I didn't mean anything by it. All I said was, yeah, I'd love to have you send that guitar and this guitar. And I said, and the good news is I don't charge for the video. So you, and he stopped immediately and goes, well, we don't pay for videos. And again, if I was smart, which sometimes I am, but sometimes you're not, I would have just not said anything. And I said, well, yeah, you do. <laughs> Cause I know the two channels that you're paying. And, uh, they were pissed. That was an understatement. They were actually really pissed. They actually went a little further than just not working with me. They, they made sure people knew that they were unhappy with me. But um, things happen, this is what I'm trying to say, with people. So that's the video they were talking about. So they were implying that somehow channels get on the naughty list. The naughty list, I just want to be clear, is not so much for companies as people at companies. So I've also had this, and this is why it's important for me not to say the companies when it's a person, because I've honestly had this happen so many times now in, in the last five years on the channel, which is a company that somebody at the company does not like me. Next thing I know, a year or two later, somebody's calling me from that company and saying, hey, can we get some product on the channel? Can we work with your channel? And they're different people. In fact, they just had that. Some cool products are coming. Literally, it's just a new new, new, uh, new um, marketing person. And they're, they, they're a fan of the channel and they're now the, the person that runs it. So... <laughs> Peace Rich 51 says they did donuts in front Phil's front yard. Yeah, they <laughs> they don't do that. Um the worst thing, the companies really can't do anything uh I don't want to say they can't do anything to me. They really really don't really have a little, whole lot of power because I don't really need them financially. But what they can do that is problematic for me and the only time I've ever had any problems with them is Sometimes I do have relationships with retailers, and as you guys know, and they to get products. And I've had them, I've had companies be so uh, not ups, upset with a video that I've done or something that was said on the podcast to where they've told the retailer they don't want, you know, not them working with me. That would be illegal, but they don't want their product even through the retailer working on the channel. So. Even, so that's really funny because that tells you a lot. That tells you how pissed they are because that means the retailer is willing to pay for the guitar to be sent out on the channel. They don't. They, so that's free advertising for them, and they still don't want it. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Um, okay. Uh, we got to get to some more subjects. Um, but like I said, check out that video. It was really cool that they uh, they do those su subjects. I think that this is the whole point of this show is to get these subjects out there and talk about them. Look, like I said, most people on YouTube are not going to be interested in this <laughs> stuff. But I'm assuming if you're hanging out on a Friday for an hour or two watching you know, this, then this is the stuff you're interested in with. You're interested in the behind the scenes stuff. And I like talking about some of the behind the scenes stuff. This is a weird, weird gig that uh, everybody, everybody, I don't care if you have a million subscribers or if you have 100 subscribers, everyone is figuring this out every day. It is not a mapped out <laughs> world when it comes to the whole YouTube thing um, at all. All I do know, and then I'll, uh, I will say this, is I feel like this is the best, this is gonna be referred to, I really believe this, this is gonna be referred to as the heyday of guitar gear and uh, and uh, guitar gear, uh, I guess, information because of the fact that one of the things that's powerful about YouTube, this platform of making guitar channels, the power of guitar channels is there's just too many of them. That's what's great. See, when there was only a few sources for you to get information, <laughs> which we know, you don't even have to go back far, 2010, uh, you know, right? We're not even talking 20 years ago. You're going to get all your guitar information from the guitar magazines. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when you have three or four sources that are giving every guitar player their information, well, those sources obviously are being paid by a few companies, well, multiple companies. But you understand if you're a company paying for all sources and you're the primary advertiser on those sources, you have a lot of weight and power with what people get to hear and not hear. Okay. On YouTube, there are so many channels, like I said, other than the biggies, right? The huge companies, the guitar companies, and then maybe a huge retailers. No one really can afford to, to pay off the five, 600. I think there's a thousand channels, but say 500 gear channels on YouTube. There's no way. So it's great. There's always going to be somebody coming up behind you and, uh, and just telling you some information, which is great. Plus not to mention, think of all the, I mean, it's mostly an independent format. <laughs> Sean Brooks, Harmony Central. I used to love Harmony Central. Do you guys remember that? What I loved about Harmony Central, for those guys who remember Harmony Central, uh, all of you remember, Harmony Central was like where you went for reviews. Remember, I, I don't even know this. I think, I don't know if they're still owned by Musician Friend, but mus Musician's Friend bought them. That's And kept it intact for a long time. I don't know how it is now. But what I loved about Harmony Central was it wasn't, it was the first, not say independent, because there was all kinds of stuff on online at that point, but it was the first time where if you read some a review of something, because that's what you'd read a review, like, hey, I got the new Boss uh, DD6 delay, and this is what I like about it. But my favorite thing when you'd read the review is you could go down to the description of the person, and it would say, uh, and it would ask them, do you consider yourself hobbyist, pro, semi-pro, working? And then it would also say, like, what gear do they own and have owned in the past? And I remember, like, I love that because somebody would be like, uh, like, oh, the new, uh, the new, I don't know, I'm just picking on something. The new um, uh, Marshall JVM is the greatest amp ever, and I've never played anything as good as that. And you're like, wow, that's a statement. And it's like, Geary owned, and it's like, great, GTX 15. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that guy's really excited about his upgrade. So not that he's wrong. It's just that gives you a reference of what he's heard <laughs> in his life. This is his first like high-end amp. So I, I loved Harmony Central for that. Um, yeah, and then Sean says, I feel like Harmony Central turned me into a uh, YouTube guitar. Turned into YouTube guitar. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's all it did. It took reviews and then created um, – it created uh, a video. Video put, you know, obviously to there. And then now it became – now you can see what their experience level is. You know what I mean? Uh, just from their playing, you can go, okay, well, they can play a little bit. So that's, you know, you, he's on par with my playing or he's below my playing level or above my playing level. That helps me figure out where, <laughs> what it's going to sound like when I play it. Um, you know what I mean? Other gear they own, you can see it, which is why I think channels stuck to this whole, let's put all our gear behind us. Besides the fact that, you know, a lot of times it was just in the room you're in, but it's more of a source of not so much like a, ha ha, look at my stuff. It's more of like a, this is the, this is the stuff I'm into. You know what I mean? So for instance, like if you look behind me, there's a lot of non heavy metal amps in here, you know, um, uh, 
And so obviously it'd be different if it was, I was like, that was a 5150 and then that was the Ingle and then underneath the Ingle was the diesel and then the diesel was, you know what I mean? It was just all like, you know, and then the black, you know, not the black star, but you get the idea. If it's all metal amps, you'd be like, okay, he's into metal amps mostly. And so when he's saying, you know, when he's saying things, you can gauge off that. You don't have to hear his whole life story. <laughs> so... RXR, I don't want to get too much in this, but I want to hit this uh, question. It says, RXR in Arizona says, what about YouTubers favoring items just to get paid? Uh, are those who only answer questions that they are uh, that are, are paying subs? So, well, first of all, let's hit with that. Uh, the trick on YouTube that you really have to pay attention to when it gets talks about getting paid for videos is... By the time most channels can get paid to do a video, I don't want to give the whole, they've done hundreds of unpaid videos and it's been a long haul. That's not what it is. By the time you get paid for videos or by the time you're getting gear that's cool to get to do videos, you really don't, it's not really you don't need it or want it, but you don't need it or want it. You know what I mean? That's really the 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 power to it. When I... When I've, I don't want to say I've interviewed YouTubers, but obviously I'm behind the scenes talking to channels, mostly not to, for any other reason than, you know, just like a lot of people who do a job, they do something that I do and I'm curious how they do it. What I've kind of learned is there's a lot of commonality in a lot of the channels in the stuff that we say to each other. And I mean channels from 10,000 subs to a million subs. These are the channels I've hung out with and maybe, you know, 5,000 subs too. I'm just trying to give you numbers, okay? Um, but what I've learned is... It seems like you're turning down. There's a point when you start out where you got to take everything that comes your way. So somebody, like I told you, when I start my channel, it's like, somebody's like, I'll send you a pedal. And you're like, please, <laughs> right? That's something I don't have to buy. Plus it's exciting because you feel like you kind of made it. That somebody wants to send you something. And now, I mean, I mean, no disrespect. It's, it's again, it's just to give you a reference. Um, there's a company a day that's trying to send me a pedal, you know what I mean, off Amazon, like every day. <laughs> I could do 30 pedals in 30 days every month for all year. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but that doesn't really get my interest going. So I'm trying to like, okay, and this is what I'm really focused on. Plus, like I said, on my channel, everybody's different. I wish I could do a video every day. I just mentally can't do it. I just feel like I start going through a routine. As soon as I do too many videos in a row, I just feel like I'm in a routine. I'm just saying the same things. I'm looking at the same things. I really kind of feel like I want to, you know, be excited. Not so much I love the gear, because sometimes it's not about that, but I want to be excited to have that moment. So that's part of the, the thing. Um, and on the second part of the question, are those who only ask your questions uh, for pay, that are paid subs, paying subs? I don't know if you have paid subs. All right, maybe you're talking about the super chats and the member services. Those are kind of things. Um, to me, my, like this, this is, I don't know, because I don't know how that works for other channels. I can tell you this on, on my on this show right here, which I've been very clear about. This show is sponsored, has been sponsored since its entirety by patrons. And the patrons, which I, being very, very honest and upfront with you guys, especially through sometimes emotionally where it's like I'm a little exhausted from, you know, sometimes, you know, like especially during the pandemic, it was a little emotional. I'm like, oh, do I want to keep doing the show? This is crazy. But I feel, I not feel, I, I am obligated to do the show every Friday. I'm being paid. I have a sponsor. It's right there in the corner. I don't know how to point to it. So, <laughs> you see it. It says fan funded. This show that you watch, I'm paid to do this show. I'm paid by the patrons. The patrons, I've given them the option a couple times to just do it on Patreon because of this, exactly what we talked about. There's 1,070 of you. I, don't, I have, think of this, there's 400 and something patrons, which is a lot, but I mean, it would cut the show in half in the live and I would be able to see more questions and interact better with the patrons, the patrons have consistently said, no, no, we want the show on the main channel. They're, they're paying, they're, they're, they're uh, I don't want to say they're paying, but they are, they are sponsoring the channel so it can be here, so we can do it here. So that's kind of how that works. Um, I will tell you, this is an odd thing to say, um, but you may not realize it, but most of the Super Chats are coming in are also the patrons. It's a very, thin, it's a very, it's a very, very, you could see it. You see, that's why you see a lot of the same 
uh, Super Chats each week. The people are very excited about the show. They're just supporting the show. It's how they keep the excitement going. But I don't know how every channel does their thing. That's how we do this thing here. And that's why I do the early risers when I do that. And that's why I look for subjects that I think are, like I said, that follow-up question was a great follow-up question to the subject. Try to hit that too. Again, just trying to balance it. Uh, what I can tell you is, uh, and I think I've said this before, I've had a few guests on this show and I can tell you that uh, 90% of them never wanted to come back because it's just too much going on. And what seems like sometimes like people are like, oh, you're not looking at it. Uh, anyone who's been on the show will tell you, it's just a mess what I'm looking at over here. Just like you guys, it's just scrolling comments that you can't keep track of. We spent way too much time on the YouTube sub subject. Like I said, if you guys ever want to do a YouTube only subject show, let me know and we'll, we'll maybe do that. All right, let's go. Uh, let's finish up some of the uh, early risers. Which is uh, Gene uh, says, "Hey Phil, what the heck is a good tulele? <laughs> Yamaha has Yamaha has one for a hundred dollars. My uh, second video I think I ever made on YouTube is my uh, Gretsch get uh, uh So it's a six string ukulele. It, it's like a guitar ukulele. It's tuned essentially like a ukulele, except for it has the other." Strings, I think. I can't do... Uh, you know what's funny is I still have that guitar, that gu guitar Um, And uh, I love it. Um, I don't use it much, so it's on my kind of like, maybe it's going to go after all these years list. But um, so Yamaha has one. Uh, Gretsch has one. I said for Gretsch's, I think they're like 250 now. The Yamaha one's great. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, I would recommend one, but that's what it is. It's, in fact, not that ukulele is uh, uh, hard to learn at all if you know how to play guitar. It takes seconds to kind of convert and play, but a good tulele is going to be even a little easier because it's just, the, you know, it's going to, the shapes, the chords won't be the same, but the shapes are the same. So you can at least make sounds using the same. What I mean by shapes is if you think about your G chord, you know that everybody knows that kind of finger shape. If you do your C chord, you kind of know that finger shape. If you make those shapes on your good tulele, they are making chords. They're just not making those chords because not in the same tuning but at least you can play the same. So like if you know a song in G, C, and D, if you play the G, C, and D patterns on the on the gitalele, it's going to sound the same, but on a ukulele, it won't be in the same key because it's not the same. But I mean, talk about like a learning curve. You're playing it immediately. <laughs> you're just not in the right key. So you're in a different key. Um, Stout Coffee says, do you like playing high output passive humbuckers? Okay. Um, he says, I love the Mojo Tone 44 Magnums. So 25, 21K. So the Mojo Tone 44 Magnums are 44 gauge string, are 44, 44 gauge wire. And how wire works on that, if you don't know, is obviously like almost all the pickups that you probably own in your guitars right now are 42 gauge wire. Uh, your Tele guitars, Telecaster guitars, your neck pickup is going to be 43 gauge. Keep in mind, the higher the number, the thinner the wire. So 44 is even thinner than 43. So what Mojo Tone is doing with the 44 Magnum is they're wrapping a crap ton of wire on there because it's smaller and get more on there, right? Because you, again, you only have so much height and so much width to wrap this wire if you're making a pickup the same size as another pickup, right? So you, your maximum amount of winds are only so many, but if you uh, go to a thinner wire, obviously you get more wire on there, okay? Um, they That's a beautiful pickup and the idea that um, uh, I... On paper, I think that pickup sounds horrible. <laughs> like, if you tell me, like, okay, it's 44 gauge wire and it's got a lot of it and it's 21K, it's like, ah, oh, just, woo, it kind of reminds me of maybe, like, uh, you know, all, I like the X2, X2N pickup. I'm just using this as a reference because I have an X2 in one of my guitars, uh, DiMarzio X2N pickup. It's like all of the things that are bad about the X2N just accentuated <laughs> on paper. But that pickup in real, t in real life, when you hear it, man, it sounds beautiful a lot of warm tones to it uh it's a beautiful pickup so uh so first uh congratulations on the pickup it's a great pickup again if you, you're interested it's mojo tone you go to their website 44 magnum and again it's 44 gauge wire um do i like playing high output pickups i i i don't i don't want to say i don't like to play them i just don't prefer them most of the pickups that i use are paf style pickups <laughs> Okay, so that's what's in the majority of my guitars, lower output pickups um, for no particular reason. <laughs> There's no like, you know, 
hard theory that's like, oh, this is why I can't use a high output pickup. I just prefer the lower output pickups. That's what's in the majority of my guitars. I've said this before. I like tremolos a lot, but you know, maybe 60% of my guitars are hardtail and 40% are tremolos. It just means maybe I like hardtails, you know, a little better than tremolos, but I still love tremolos. Same thing with pickups. Uh, I would say I'm 60, maybe 70, 30, 70% 70 of my guitars have lower output pickups. 30% have higher output pickups. I, it also has to do with the amps that I like to use. Obviously, you know, since I've started my channel, I've been using this very same Fender Princeton 68 uh, reissue Princeton. This is my go-to amp to this day. Obviously, you know, over time, you know, you get to collect a beautiful collection of amps and this is the amp that's still, you know, I still love it. It's one of the few amps that if I had to, you know, you know what, if you only keep one amp, if you notice it's, it changes because sometimes you're in honeymoon mode with something, but this is definitely an amp that gets always, like I can tell you right now, if I get to keep two amps, <laughs> that's one of the two guaranteed. And because I, I know the other one would just be what's on my, like my, you know, what I'm in love with now, a list. I think really, to be honest with you, if I was going to just say, if I could keep just, I know three amps is like a lot, but if I was going to get rid of everything down to three amps, I would keep my uh, Dirty Shirley Mini, the Bad Cat, and that Princeton. And that's because like, to me, that's Marshall. That's of course Fender. And that's like Vox and Matchless and Boutique um, and everything else would go. And I wouldn't, and I would, uh, to get the other high gain amps, I would run a pedal. That's basically what I would do. I've actually thinned out my collection of amps again. I'm on the thinning side right now. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm on that way as we speak. I'm getting rid of a couple more. I just got rid of like six. I got like three more to go. So, because they were pluming up over time. Okay. And now, Stan wants everybody to hit the thumbs up button. I appreciate that, Stan. Ah, oh, bro. Uh, I was looking for stuff that's about this subject, but this is a good subject. Um, I'm going to say Brian. Brian H794 says, Phil, um, where should someone start if they want to learn to build guitars? Well, you can go to a Luthery school. There's like Roberto Venn. There's Luthier schools. You can take a course from like Texas Toast and places like that. If you're in, you know, in, in Europe, you can go to uh, um, Crimson Guitars and take a course, a class. Those are gold, man. Those classes fantastic. I don't think anyone truly understands the value of that. As you guys know, I did a video. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> a little burp. Uh, uh, as you know, I did a video where I got to build a 5e3 uh, clone amplifier through Mojo Tone and took a class on how to build amps. And uh, it was it was just so exciting for me to do something that I don't plan to ever do again, but to have so much reference and information to it, I highly recommend it. I would say the same thing if you get to build a guitar. Building a guitar is a very exciting experience. And so there's that. Now, that's what I would say take advantage of if you can. Those are going to be expensive, not as expensive as going to the school. That's great. Second thing you do is build kits, right? Um, you know, think about, think about this. If you well, I've interviewed, uh, as you guys know, I've interviewed so many guitar builders, and there is a story that is very consistent. They repaired guitars. I mean, think of this. Most of the builders fall into two categories. They were either repairing guitars, and then they started building guitars, or they were working for someone who was building guitars, and they started building their own guitars. So essentially, that that's the map to success. I mean, it's obviously worked for all these guys. You can do it as well. So you can repair guitars, and that teaches you how to build them get you started, or you can do a kit guitar and maybe do something that's just put the kit guitar together and finish it off and make it great. And then next time, make may, maybe make the body and only use the neck or just buy a neck and do it that way. Um, and, and that's essentially how it works. What I will tell you for most builders is the neck is always last. It's just how it, how it goes. It's really, if you think about it, it's the only really complex thing to do. And when I say complex, I mean of the equation, right? Building the body, everything else, it's pretty basic. Um, I can tell you, I can tell you from friends over the years that I've had that are carpenters. Um, all my friends that are carpenters have successfully built a guitar. They had more than enough experience from just learning to do that. Like learning, they know how to measure, they know how to cut wood, they know how to put things together. Essentially, the only thing, and the reason I say this is because they're my friends. So I've, they've always asked me, like, hey, could you check this out or give me some insight? And everything I always help them with happens to be on the setup process and how you fine tune maybe some things like fret work and stuff. 
but everything else, they, they really didn't need anybody to teach them. So that's what I would recommend as a starting point. And I would definitely recommend to do it. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, trolls, trolls. I don't know how to say your man, man. <laughs> trolls. It looks like tr tr Trolls Saint Journey says, Wheels Easy Guitar has a course. Of course, he has a course. You know what's funny is I'm trying to think. His course is pretty complete and really good. And there's another one I thought that has a good course. I, I didn't even, th thank you for bringing that up. I didn't even think about the people that have courses on this. That's even, that's even better because you can learn as you need to, better than having to sign up for a class uh, and taking shots at it. And of course, tons of YouTube videos. Um... Okay, sorry, I'm just looking for anything that's on the subjects we're talking about. Yeah, a lot of you guys are saying take the class. Well, like I said, um, one of the things I will tell you is, and some of you guys mentioned Steve Max, uh, Dan Erlewine, early wine co course, again, another great course. One thing I should tell you about the classes is when I say they're invaluable and they're great, they're great, it's not only is it great, but like a lot of things like that, they eventually kind of go away. There's not a lot of people to stick with making the classes because it's very hard for them to be profitable um, in the long term of it, right? Um, and what I mean by that is there's no, in a business business uh, scope, business for even small business, like everybody wants, just like everybody who has a job, everybody wants growth. Everybody wants to know that there's a raise coming down the road, a opportunity coming down the road, a retirement coming down the road, right? There's something you need to get from what you're doing, the work you're putting in, and hopefully something that will be improved in your in your life in most cases, right? And owning a business is no different than that. You're looking for, not, not every business is about getting rich. Most business owners in this country, I can't speak about the whole world, but in this country, the, one, the ones I've known, most of them are just trying to do exactly what everybody who's working trying to do. I wanna make a living, make sure my kids are provided for, right? Maybe put some retirement away, that'd be a nice benefit if you can do that. But more importantly, you know, keep up with, you know, in other words, improve and grow. So the problem sometimes with these courses is there's just not a whole lot of growth because it's a tapped resource. Like if two people are teaching six people, then you think, okay, well then to get three more people, you can get one more person teacher, but it's harder than that. You know what I mean? It's hard to scale it up. So what is happening over time is uh, even though they're, they're happy about making money now, over time they go, okay, well, we can make money other ways. Or, uh, one of the things, if you notice on YouTube, with with anyone who has YouTube channels and does stuff like that, is eventually you'll notice they focus on the YouTube side, which is the selling of things, like whether they're guitars or their things. Because uh, let's be honest, there's an audience there buying it. I mean, you used to pay a fortune for the advertising that all these companies, small companies now on YouTube, get for I want to say free, but it's gonna be as close to free as possible. Um, uh, six Foot, and this is the last early riser I want to hit. So Six Foot says, love the show. I was wondering how do you keep all your guitars dusted and cleaned new str on new strings? Uh, seems like a full-time job. Do you just kind of do a few at a time? It's real simple. I play them, and if I don't play them, they go. <laughs> that's a that's a simple simple thing. Um, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So I've I've said this many times before. If I'm not playing a guitar, I don't mean every day, but I mean I have to get use out of it. Um, there's guitars sometimes that I absolutely love, and I go, man, I'm just not getting any play time on it anymore. You know, maybe that. And I I other than being aware of the fact that I was probably in a phase, and I might come back to that phase. One of the things that happens to me. And it and and you know COVID jacked this up for a while, which is I like to go to live shows, and so sometimes I go to live shows and I come back from the live show and I'm like, man, I just want to play that song, those those songs, and I now I just want a guitar like that guitar they play, so I can just play that music, and I'll play that music for months and drive my family crazy <laughs> until it's like burned out, and then I I don't do it anymore. Uh, Vim69 says, hey, Phil, uh, two questions today. Uh, when are you going 
to Texas Toast to pick up your challenger, question mark. Two is when will you do a live KYG from the workshop so we can show us the tools and tips? Great questions. Thank you, Vimps. Um, first is the Texas Toast thing. They are having a great guitar build off. I might be going to that. I haven't really talked to them guys recently, but I've told you guys if they're doing something like that, I'm interested. And so I don't know anything other than that. It's been a little crazy time, I'm sure, for them. It's been crazy uh, for me because, like I said, when I got COVID, I was... I was down, I, like I said, I was down hard for three days. I kind of felt like three days after that, I was really not feeling too great. Remember, my wife had it with me, so it was like the whole household shot, right? Like nothing's getting done. And then, um, to be honest with you, it's just, if you, I'm sure you heard, you're just kind of tired, so you're just dragging. You're not getting stuff done. So I feel like, and I feel like I'm pretty confident in this, I feel like I got two weeks behind through, uh, maybe some of it was my own, like maybe I should have been a little bit more motivated, but some days I would be working for four hours and I'm just like, I'm going to go, I'm done. <laughs> so just a little kind of burnt out, you know, and tired. So what I'm trying to say is, um, uh, there's a little bit of like, I haven't fully caught up on things and I've been working on it. I've been working on it. I feel like I'm getting closer and closer each day. Um, um, and part of my thing too, is remember I have all this stuff I do that's not YouTube and, Sometimes that can choke up a couple of days and throw me behind on, on the YouTube side. And YouTube side sometimes throw me behind on the other side. Um, but the other part was uh, live shows from the, uh, from the workshop area. We did a couple, and I found they didn't work. And the reason they don't work for me is uh, what worked better was just doing the videos pre-recorded from there. So we'll probably continue to do that. Um, I was thinking about doing a live stream with that Kramer that somebody sent to me and do the fret sprout correction and do that while we do this. My biggest problem that I've learned from my live show that's different than some other live shows is um, a lot of live shows, they'll do stuff. You know, like a lot of you guys are like, restring your guitar. Uh, Johnny Bean restrings his guitar and stuff. There's channels that just do stuff. And I see those and it does well. But um, this show moves really fast. Like I'm really involved in the QA. Like I know, I notice most channels, they're doing something and then they look up and they look at some, what some of you guys are saying. I'm, I'm really trying to hit as many of you as possible. Um, so that's kind of my concern is I'm afraid if I'm looking down for five minutes, you know what I mean? I might, I might, I might miss too much. I'm already missing too much now. <laughs> I mean, that's really, <laughs> uh, the, uh, so that's uh, that's basically what it is. But uh, like I said, it's a great idea, as Vimps. I, I love the idea. We'll keep working on it. Um, Huff Daddy says, just watch the Dave Grohl on Hot Ones. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, it says, pitching for uh, pitching the Foo Fighters movie. You going to check it out? I'm definitely going to check it out. I'm a huge Foo Fighters fan. I haven't watched the Foo Fighters um, Hot Ones Challenge yet. We've been saving it. So it's pinned. Um, I have YouTube, the premium thing. So I can just push, you know, you just push download and it downloads for you. And I have it. I have it all pinned to her. I mean, you can, you can pin a video too, but so I have, so sometimes when we're watching stuff, I'll watch some YouTube stuff. Um, Modern Vintage said, can you speak on why you feel PRS cores are uncomfortable? Oh, okay. Uh, and why you sold them. Well, I haven't sold any of them. <laughs> have you found them uh, to feel longer in reach due to the biggest being doing, oh, to the bridges being closer to the neck? Okay, so let me get to the easy part of this. Um, I like the S2 carve, which is why I like my Mira carve. The P my Mira is a core, and it doesn't have the voluted side, the, the lip. I don't like the lip on the PRS. I'm not a big fan. Uh, when I In 2009, when I was touring the PRS factory, Paul Reed Smith was giving us a personal tour, um, which obviously was way pr before YouTube. Um, I, I tell everybody this story because it, it really seemed like – not to upset him, but man, definitely hit him weird. We were walking, and I still don't know why what possessed me to do this. We were walking through the factory, and I saw a neck. I don't know what if it was a custom 24 or 22, but it was a neck glued into a body. It was unfinished. Obviously, it was in the, that stage. And I picked it up. Like, I shouldn't have touched it. I picked it up, and I said, see, Paul, this is what I want. I want a PRS with no finish on it, and I just want you to sand the edge so it's comfortable like a strap for my arm. And he's like, <laughs> he's just looking at me like, what the hell are you saying? So um, when they made the S2s, that's essentially what they did. I love the S2s. Um, so that's what it is to me. I still have the cores. that I can't sell my cores, and here's why you can't sell them. Uh, it's part of the what I've told you before when it comes to the inflationary problem with the high-end guitars. There's just, once you sell, like if I sold my custom 24 core, I'll never buy one again in my entire life. There's just no way. 
because you're never going to sell it for what it's going to cost you to replace. So there's no upside. Like I told you, it's, it, and so I, that's why I have it because although I like playing it, I love the way it sounds, I prefer the S2. I prefer my S2s. If I would have bought S2s before I bought cores, I would have never bought cores, but I didn't do it that way. I bought S2s and then years later, and it's very, very clear. Um, I mean, the cores that I currently own, like my Custom 24, that Ariza Verde one, um, I paid for it. It's a 10 top and I paid for it half. It's not an exaggeration. I paid half of what it's going for new now without a 10 top. Not that the 10 top matters anyway. I'm just giving you a reference of scope of price difference from that year. I don't know what year that one is. I want to say it's a 2013. It might be a 2014. So I give you an idea. Like it's just crazy, but that's it. That's the only issue with the course. I like the, I like the SEs and, and the uh, S2s uh, for comfort more, just a comfort thing. Fernando says, Hey Phil, what's the best solid state amp that has compression similar to a tube amp that what a great question, Fernando, uh, Fernando, because, um, I, that's my trick. <laughs> you know, if I can't, if I plug into a solid state amp and it's just not doing it for me, I immediately plug in a compression pedal. Um, if you notice on the, when I started this channel, I would talk about compressors a lot. I've done a lot of videos on compressors and I would own a lot of compressors. And it was because I would play a lot more solid state amps and compression, a compressor pedal to me feels more like a tube amp. I feel like when I'm hitting a note, you know what I mean? It kind of sponges a little bit. There's a little bit of like, it comes out and comes back in. There's a little bit of that uh, feel there. And I love it. And then of course, compression pedals by by the nature of it are sustain pedals. That's why they sometimes are called sustainer pedals, sometimes they come compression. So not only does it do this kind of spongy effect that I think tube amps do, it also holds the note a little longer, which is also something I think tube amps tend to do. So um, no solid state amps that I know of come with compressors built in them, right? So what's the best tube amp that has a compression? Uh, and so I know you're not talking about a, a physical compressor, you're talking about the compression effect in it, um, but I have not, found one. The closest solid state amp I've played that has the compression aspect that I love is probably like the Roland Jazz Chorus, right? The And I've played the smaller one, but in a store, and it I feel like it wasn't doing the same thing the bigger one was doing. But again, I was in a store and I had no reference of it. And um, the Roland Jazz Chorus, the newer, smaller ones would be something I would definitely check out. But um, that, and I'm trying to think if there's another solid state amp that does does it. Like I said, I don't have a problem with solid state or tube amps. I've said this before. There's no, there, I just, like I said, I love this saying. I've said it for years now. I love good sounding amps. <laughs> just most of the amps that I think are good sounding happen to be tube. That doesn't mean tube amps are good sounding amps. Just means that's the, how the ratio works. And if you look behind me, there's all these amps, but then there's that Kemper. I'm using that Kemper all the time. And I use, uh, and I use that just as much as anything else. And I, right now I'm playing a solid state amp as we speak, uh, for a review. And, um, that's what I'm trying to figure out is how good the clean channel is. Cause that's all I care about as well is to see how good it is. Um, but some of you guys might have some great suggestions for some solid state amps as well. Yeah. Aaron short music saying the Kemper has several compression. Uh, exactly. Exactly. But keep in mind, you can always put a compressor on your amp. That's what I did forever. Uh, Meester says, happiest birthdays to your wife. Thank you for making KYG and Blackstock so terrific. Thank you so much for that. Uh, nothing fancy restaurant-wise sounds fun. Um, there's a restaurant that my wife absolutely loves. Um, and, I, it's, it's, uh, and they give you $10 off on your birthday. <laughs> so she wants to go there for that. I think that's what I think is the plan it says, uh, remind me of Walker Hayes fancy, like ode to Applebee's. Well, you know, you know, if you go to Applebee's on Friday, you want somebody to listen to your stories. Anyone get that reference for that movie? Yeah. Like you don't want to go to Applebee's and have no one to hear your stories on Friday. Uh, so there you go. We actually have an Applebee's like by the house. I try to convince my wife to go all the time. She will not. I, every once in a while I get her to go. I, I try to convince her that if you go there and have a beer and an appetizer, it's, I don't know. I don't get what's bad or good about it. She explains it to me every time. So <laughs> Rich says, how important is it to have an effects loop for delay and reverb? Well, 
it's it's not super important because uh, almost half the music probably you, you love uh, they, those amps didn't exist. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, a lot of players like Eddie Van Halen didn't run his stuff through an effects loop for years because he was playing through a Marshall. So, um, there you go. The, um, so is it important? It's not that important. It's, it's, it's a preference. That's it. You know, uh, adjusting things through, so through the front or through the back. It's cleaner. A lot of people prefer it, but again, uh, you know, it's just preference. Hold on one second. I think I'm going to sneeze. Yep, you dismissed it. I sneezed. <laughs> Tis the season here in Arizona to sneeze. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad I caught that. Okay. Because <laughs> sometimes it just comes on you fast. Uh, says, um, I'm going to say Camilla, Camilla Gad. I hope I'm saying close. It says here's a here's a beer on me. Also, I'm looking to buy a Sierra Tone JM100 head, and an, and I need a cab. Do you have any recommendations for the cab uh, for that head uh, for the high headroom cleans? I don't. Uh, you know, it's, I'm not familiar with that amp. That's not an amp that I've actually had experience with. So, um, so I don't know what you know what cab complements it. That's the that's the problem for. For clean, I like pine, big, oversized pine cabinets. That's what I like. Uh, I just like it. Um, you see my PRS amp right here. Underneath it is a 112, but it's an oversized 112, all pine uh, uh, cabinet that I absolutely love. Um, and so that's what I like. So sometimes you can go to, you know, and have one made cheap, cheaper on through Mojo Tone than you can buy one from a brand. But I like the oversized pine cabinets. I think they just have more low end and they punch and they just sound good. So that's my, my that's my personal preference. So I'm reading Modern Vintage's question. And it's a, it's taking me a second to process this. That was my delayed pause drink to figure this out. Okay, <laughs> it says do custom shop strats with a 12 inch radius. And 1.6 nut, 10.56 V-necks fill wider than, okay, hold on a second. I'm going to read this whole question because otherwise I'm going to be piecing it together. Okay, so the, the core of his question, he's also talking about his Gibson R9 is basically a bigger neck, but feels smaller than his Silver Sky. Well, that's the problem. So at the core of his question, he wants me, he's asking me about two custom shop necks that from Fender that are different sizes with different profiles. One's got the 60C shape, one's got the soft, right? So, oh no, it didn't say soft, just the V-shaped neck. This is the problem with doing reviews and doing videos. If you notice, I will measure things and give you measurements, but I say feels like this. I I do the measurements only so that you guys have them for a reference in case that's important to you. And also, cause I know that's something you're accustomed to seeing. Um, so I do it. However, I really honestly believe when I tell you like this neck feels, if you've seen me, I have told you guys out and outright many times, like this neck says it's a U shaped measured at blah, 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 but it feels like a C shape. And it feels like this neck The feels like is the closest thing. For instance, the Gibson R9, which does have a chunky neck, does feel about the does not feel thicker and bigger to me than my uh, uh, Silver Sky. My Silver Sky also feels not chunky, but chunkier in that reference. So yeah, um, so measurements don't tell the whole story because we 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 know the carve, you know, the shoulder, how it comes around the sides, whether or not it's dramatically fast or kind of dramatically fast, just dramatic, you know, c cuts quick and then shallows out. So it's not just the thickness there's all kinds of shaping that is going on there and it's a big deal and then the, the radius of the fretboards and the type of frets it's just everything kind of comes into play that's why it, that's the one thing that sucks about these online reviews you can get a sense of a lot of things about the guitars but the feel of the neck is the hardest which is why i try to go to descriptive in non-techie terms when i talk about them because i want you to i'm trying to relay to you what and there's a and there's a there's a benefit. Some of the smaller channels that watch the channel and, 
uh, this channel and, and you do reviews, I want you to think about this. This is uh, something I think about all the time. A company can't say, okay, can't is harsh, probably won't say. Well, won't say is the absolute fact. They won't say it. Probably can't say it. Fender can't make a neck and go, hey, this feels like a Gibson 60s neck. <laughs> okay, they're not going to do that. Um, more importantly, new companies that are starting out that have their own neck profiles, they're not going to say it feels like a Fender. This feels like the Fender 60s neck. This feels like the Fender 50s neck. This feels like... Um, you know, again, uh, a Mex I use a made Mexico Strat as reference all the time. Like I always say, like a little thinner feeling than a Mexican Strat. Why? Because I figure nine out of 10 of you may have picked up a Mexican Strat uh, in a guitar center and have reference of when I say that. Where if I measured it, what if I said it, I measured it and you go, yeah, but it's thicker. So it's going to feel different than the made Mexico Strat. And what I'm telling you, it does feel like that. It doesn't feel like that. So what I'm saying is, is that the reason why I say, when I say feels like, I mention other guitar brands is I'm mentioning brands I think you have, have reference of. So you can get like, okay, yeah, I guess if my Made Mexico Strat was a little thicker, I wouldn't mind it. Or I would hate it because it's at the maximum I can take now. That's a reference. So to answer your question, that's the problem is exactly what you're getting at. I know your problem. You're trying to gauge right now how much close they are. Um, the, uh, right. I have my journeyman strat behind me. This has the, uh, sixties uh, C oval C. I don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's the Fender sixties over C. This is the weirdest neck. I, I like it. I like this guitar, but it, if I was, I tell you, I like the, uh, road worn, uh, uh, road worn, uh, sixties neck more than this neck. It's a little thinner. Feels to me more like what a 60s neck. The problem is, and this this could well the problem could be when they when when companies do these necks and stuff is Fender may make a neck and call it a 60s neck for 10 years. And so everyone has reference of it. And then one day they finally get a 1960 blah 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 and they look at it and they go, well, it's technically not that neck. And then they do what's called a more accurate neck carve. And then now it's throwing everybody off because they've been playing these you know, these reissues for so long that are not exact. So it's, it's just how it goes. And so. <laughs> Richard said, what, what guitar did Mrs. McKnight get you for your birthday? No, no. Oh, for her birthday. I was going to say, no, no guitar for me, but <laughs> yeah, it's because it's her birthday. So. Um, Ryan says, thank you for helping me get into guitar for two, two years ago. I was recovering from surgery that changed my life and needed something to give my life purpose again on playing mostly acoustic. Uh, how do acoustic amps differ than others such as the spark and the THR? Well, the spark and the THR do have an acoustic setting and they gonna make a passable acoustic sound. Uh, I mean, obviously it's like any modeling technology platforms, uh, where like, you know, the Katana does an acoustic sound and it's really good, but it's, they're not, they're not, they're not going to be the same. Just like those amps are great. Are they the same as the real deal? Like is the Spark THR10 Katana, do they sound exactly like a Marshall Plexi? No, they're Plexi-esque. The Plexi is going to be, you know, a real Plexi is going to be more, I don't want to say more, but you know what I mean? It's, it's going to have a different feel to it. Um, where an acoustic amp will do the same thing. You get an acoustic amp, you're going to notice a big difference. Um, so, I mean, if you're into acoustic and you play a lot of acoustic, I definitely think getting investing in a nice acoustic amp and getting a looping pedal is like, uh, it's worth its weight in gold. You should do that for sure. So, uh, and I'm glad you found guitar. That's what happened to me. So, you know, I had a horrible traumatic event happen in my life. Um, and uh, and uh, that's how I ended up back in music. As you guys know, I've kind of told the story. I was in corporate world. I don't have that corporate story. I don't have a story that's like, I was in the corporate world and I couldn't take it anymore. And I went back and I got a farm. <laughs> like, that's a great story. It's a, but that's not my story. Um, I was in the corporate world and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I had a great management position. I was, uh, well, I was well liked at the company uh, to the point, you know what I mean? I had a lot of friends, still have a lot of friends there. And, um, but I had something traumatic, same, same kind of thing. Ryan happened, a life-changing event. And uh, it's, uh, I had to make a change. That's what happens sometimes. Sometimes you have to make a change uh, because something happens to you and that's the only way you can move forward. That's what happened with me. 
And uh, that's how I ended up with a music store. <laughs> I know it's a, it's a kind of a weird thing. I was already making basses at the time and doing the corporate thing. Like I said, I felt like it was a perfect, you know, I, I got to do the thing I loved and I had a safe job, which was nice. But unfortunately, life happens and you have to deal with it. So what I'm trying to say, Ryan, is congratulations to you for making a change and moving forward. And, uh, and uh, I hope it works out. And I think you should get an acoustic camp. <laughs> That's what I would suggest. I like the Fishman Loud Box, but again, there's a lot of great ones out there. If you're looking for an affordable acoustic amp, I think some of the new Fender amps are really good for the money, for sure. Um, uh, Modern Vintage says, has Gibson ever mentioned master builders, or will they always have to find the good ones even in the 10K range? I don't know. I don't know if... Gibson has master builders. I don't know if they do that. Like Fender, Fender actually has master builders, people, you know, named, you know, uh, builders. Uh, I'm not really familiar with that as such. I can't afford them <laughs> if they, you know what I mean? So like Fender, uh, Fender custom shop is already at my, just already at the highest threshold to where I can barely justify or tolerate or get into that market. It's the highest echelon. It, it takes like, it's like, it, it's just the, you know, like I, I've said this before, when people buy guitars, they tend to buy a lot of the same type of guitars. So if you're in the $300 guitars, you're going to have 10 of them. If you're going to, if you're in the $3,000 guitars, you'll have 10 of those. If you're in $10,000 guitars, they have 10 of those. That's my experience interacting, selling guitars, you know, as, as, as through the store uh, and all the years working on guitars. When I work on a guitar, people tend to bring the same guitars over and over again. Like here's another guitar that I have. And there seem to be, if they hit a price point they're comfortable with, they just buy that price point over and over again. Um, and there is exceptions to those rules in the idea that somebody with a lot of high-end guitars has a couple inexpensive ones and a couple of somebody with a lot of inexpensive guitars can have a high-end one. And that's how I am with the expensive guitars. I'll have one or two outliers. And so like, a uh, Fender master belt is just out of my, it's out of my wheelhouse for like anything I'm going to pay for. So, and usually it ha it takes an external event for me even to make those kind of those purchases. So I don't know if they have that. I just know, uh, I don't know. Like I said, I, I was hoping to find an RO that I liked as much as my R9. That experience didn't go well doesn't really sadden me or, you know, sour the taste for me for go any further, but I'm not in the mood to do it anytime soon. And plus, like I said, I found, I went Fender. I was going to go Gibson instead. I went Fender. Uh, Jim says, have you, have you been able to check out any of the USA made harmony guitars? Uh, are there imported guitars? Love the channel. I haven't tried any of them. The harmony guitars are made by G and L, right? That's how it works. G and L makes the harmony guitars. I believe that's the the thing. Uh, GNL is now three companies, right? It's like Harmony Guitars, GNL, and then there's like a pedal company, right? Something else that they brought back another brand. Maybe it's an amp company. There's three brands now, I think, under that umbrella of that company. So they might actually be made in the same factory. Uh, Harmony Guitars might be made in the. In the why do I say GNL? I am so sorry, guys. <laughs> you could probably some people are like, "What? That's not true." Uh, uh, Harmony Guitars are made by Heritage Guitars. <laughs> sorry about that. Totally, totally, oh, I don't know why I had that in my head. So Heritage Guitars now owns Harmony Guitars and then I think a pedal or an amp brand that they brought back, just like Harmony. It's a brand that was they re, they bought the brand name and brought it back. And I think the Harmony Guitars are made where Heritage Guitars are. So interesting, uh, you know. Yeah, CC, now you guys are saying BBE, but BBE, BBE is uh, G&L. And so BBE owns GNL. So I was wrong. I was like I said, it's Harmony is made in Kalamazoo. Yep. And Harmony is, uh, oh, so it is. So Har Harmony is made also where Heritage is made, which is a very interesting thing because they're very affordable considering they're made in the same kind of factory, same place. I thought Ryan and 60 Cycle Hum did one, a review. You guys might know. And if he did, you might want to check it out. I don't know. I didn't see it on his channel. I just remember in passing talking to him at the 2020 NAM, and we were talking about what like, cool things you've seen. And he mentioned the harmonies are really cool, and he was very excited about them. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then I didn't. Ah, Tiesco. Yeah, thank you, Craig. So it's Tiesco, Harmony, and Heritage. They're on now one, one under one umbrella. So it's all coming from the same people. Very cool. I have no hookups with them. No, no, nothing. So I have no way to to get into that now. So we'll see. One day happens. Part of that problem, as you guys know, is I don't really solicit companies very often. 
it's a really horrible thing. <laughs> like I'm not sending out emails very actively. Um, I probably should. I really should. Like a lot of times you guys ask me about stuff like that. And even I kind of sometimes go, you know, maybe I should just reach out to them and see if they want to send something out versus sometimes I buy the thing for the channel. But, uh, but you know, okay. Uh, Meester says, Lug now makes a six string model. Okay, Meester, because Meester was talking to us. Remember about the Lug three strings, uh, three string guitar, three string guitars we were talking about a couple weeks ago. Acoustic model, electric model, built in speaker, great for kids in the travel. I will check that out. Like I said, so that makes sense. That's a good evolution of them to go from the three string to the six string guitar, more traditional. Uh, I, like I said, the three string should not scare people. It should be easier. It's half as hard to learn as a, a six string, but I think sometimes it does scare people. <laughs> uh, um, so hold on a second. The next one came from Enrico it says, Hey, did you see electro harmonics press release today on tubes? I did not. Let's see. Let's see if I can find it real fast. Obviously, as you guys know, electro harmonics, is in New York, and they do a lot of Russian-based tubes. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I did, I looked now to see if they had something I could f find it. Let's see if I can find it on their website. And, huh? Let's see. contact us. I don't see the press release. If you guys see it, you can give me a a link. Let's see how fast you guys are finding it. Anyone finding it? I'll look for another second. I'm looking for usually on websites they have like a news updates, contact us, customer service. Site map, policies, I don't see anything. So I don't see the information. I'd love to share it with you guys. Does anyone have a find a link or anything? <laughs> Otherwise, it's on there. Amanda says it's on their Instagram. I don't know if I can do Instagram. I mean, I know you can do Instagram from your computer, but I don't think I have it set up. Let's see. Um, no, <laughs> I was going to say, I told you guys, I don't really do Instagram uh, very often, so I don't have anything kind of set up. So, so I don't, I did not see it. Um, let's find, hold on. I know this is going a little slow, but I'm kind of curious, right? You have me curious. Let's pull it up this way. I was hoping to share it with you. That's kind of what I wanted to find, but if I... Okay. Um... I don't see it on their Instagram either, guys. I'm on their Instagram right now. Oh, somebody saying no more pogs? That's what I'm, like I said... Hmm. Yeah, I don't see. I'm not seeing it. So, yeah, so basically what you're saying is they're just letting you know. Look, we already know. you got to understand there's a bunch of problems that we all have to deal with right now. Uh, obviously, there's real issues in the world, and then there's what we talk about on this channel, right? This is our fun time to talk about the things that we like to talk about and not worry about what's happening outside of the guitar world and talk about that stuff. But obviously, like I told you guys last week, tubes are going to be a problem because... Again, they were already a problem before. There's a lot of problems that are, are going to be uh, expanded on. Kind of understand. There's a problem with um, with cobalt right now with nickel. There's going to be the supply chain issues were already problematic. The prices were already problematic. They're going to get worse. Obviously, if you guys know cobalt nickel, you're going to see that in pickups. 
pickups are going to be a problem coming uh, soon. This is going to, we're going to see price increases besides what we were already seeing. We already had supply chain issues. Like I said, we're just compounding all the problems that we're seeing now, which is supply chain issues, uh, obviously um, inflation. And now of course, all this is just going to add to that as well. And we talk about that because this is the thing you need to understand. If these are things that you enjoy and you want to, uh, to purchase them, I would suggest doing that now. I can't imagine it's going to get any better anytime soon. So Sean says the guitar players are going to hoard tubes like they do toilet paper. Well, you know, sad thing is this is different. <laughs> Here's why this is different. Um, hoarding tubes. Of course, I'm not a, I'm not a proponent for that. So, you know, I bought some tubes and I like to flat out. I'll tell you exactly what I did. And this is what I did. I bought six 12 AX7 JJ tubes. I bought two 12 AU7 JJ tubes. I like JJs. They're cheap and they're good. Um, and I bought two A12 AT7 JJ tubes. And then I um, I ordered one set of J JJ power tubes that I needed for an amp. The reason is, is this. I don't change power tubes on my amps. I mean, once every 10 years, if I've done that, you know what I mean? I, I can name, I can name on one hand, hand how many times I've changed out the power tubes, but preamp tubes are what I don't want to be in a situation. I'm not really afraid that they're, we're not going to be able to get them. I just don't want to pay $55 for a 12 AX7. Look, I could already buy a 12 AX7 a year ago for $9 and now it's 15. So... So uh, that's what I, and preamp tubes are more likely to go out. They're more problematic. You know what I mean? So that, that's why you might want to have a couple preamp tubes laying around. It's not very expensive. You can buy maybe two or three, $30, $45 now. And like I said, you might be in a situation in a year where it's going to cost you that for one preamp tube. So think about that. Just something to be, uh, think about if your goal is to hoard them up and then throw them on reverb and make money on them. Look, that's up to you guys. I don't do that stuff. I've never been into that. Um, and I don't really judge people what they're doing either. I'm not a big proponent for it, as you know, but you know, I've talked about this before. I, I don't like it to the point where when I get asked about that uh, Keeley Caverns that we're going to do a limited run with Keeley Caverns with the KYG, the main issue was they wanted to do 50 units. And I was convinced and still am that 50 units will sell out so fast that everybody will just put them up on reverb for 400 bucks. And I just hate that. So I want to do 100 units. I've had friends, some of you, my patrons tell me like, that's not enough. I don't know how many is enough. I just feel like I, you know, a hundred is enough or not enough, but that's the number. So again, that's why we've held back on it. I just won't, I just won't, you know what I mean? I don't like the scalping and stuff, but like I said, this is, remember, this is all stuff or fun. So I'm just giving you some heads up on, obviously, like I've said, when we're having, buying the stuff that are for our personal enjoyment, we definitely you know, you'd like to purchase it before it goes up crazy. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so just something to think about. All right. Anyways, let's... Uh, hold on a second. I'm just looking to see anything else that's important. All right. Uh, back to... Next subject. The next subject. Voodoo Fist did a, a super chat for the tip jar. I appreciate that, man. So did Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. I appreciate that as well. Um, I can't remember, Johnny, if I owe you a text message back. <laughs> so, you know, I owe three people a text back uh, um, <laughs> uh, and with two are companies and I think one is you. So if I haven't texted you back, sometimes, um, my friend says, uh, Oh, Phil went dark. Uh, if you texted me and I'm texting back with you and all of a sudden, you know, I'm not getting text back. It's cause somewhere on my phone, I'm just not following the thread anymore. So if you text me again, just poke me or whatever you call it. <laughs> just, uh, my friend always sends me some kind of emoji and then I go, Oh, sorry. Cause I thought I, I thought I answered it. I get a little, I start texts and then I don't send them cause I'm in draft mode and then I don't send them. 
Uh, Grumpy Mike Guitar says, for the tone jar and why not? I, I never read that anymore. I figured I'd give him one because, he you know, why not? Wishing the lovely Mrs. McKnight happy birthday. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Um, it's uh, I took her to breakfast this morning. My daughter bought her flowers. Um, and, uh, and like I said, we'll go to dinner tonight. <laughs> She's getting a new guitar. <laughs> She's getting a pink silver sky. I'm just kidding. Uh, Richard says, have a great, 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 I'm sorry. I made myself laugh with the pink guitar. I got her a bowling ball that says Philip McKnight. That's a Homer Simpson joke, right? You got Marja bowling ball that says Homer Simpson. Uh, Richard says, have a great weekend. Love to start my weekend watching KYG. I appreciate that. It's uh, how I like to start my weekend too. Um, Mike says, happy birthday to Mrs. McKnight. Brian said, I need to relic and rust a pickup. Bridge Friedman Classic Plus to match the McMars uh, HSS Relica. Any tips on corroding the pole pieces? There's a couple ways you can do it. Some of the ways are easiest is just some salt water solution. Um, you can, I'm, I'm not telling you to do this. I'm just telling you how it's done. There's a couple ways to do it. And I'm going to tell you the way I like the most. Um, you can use muriatic pool acid. Uh, that technique I've used in the past, it's again, scary. But uh, if you have a pool, you probably have some muriatic pool acid. You put it in a cup and you uh, uh, use a mesh bag and you put the parts in a mesh bag and you hang it over. The vapors will just do all the work. You don't have to leave it more than just overnight or a few hours. Again, the longer you leave it, the more it's going to rust, so to speak, or start the rusting. Um, if you watch my, uh, you, need, you may want to just go rewatch, rewatch the uh, beer caster video because in that I show you a solution that works really good and uh, in that when I submerge it in there on your guitar pole on your pole pieces you would just take I would use a q-tip and dip it in there and just put it on there and that solution works really good that's probably the best solution it is and so you know I use it so infrequently that's why I got to tell you to go <laughs> go Go to that video because whatever it is, that's the formula. If I was down in the shop, I probably have it written down. I could just read it to you, but why not just watch the video? Um, it's in there. It's in, and it's in the first part of the video. It works really well. Um, and so, you know, little goes a long way <laughs> So of everything. Um, Cause where I live, like I said, it's very dry. So once I start the process, I don't have to worry about it. But if you live in a wet climate, it's going to continue to rust. Jeremy says, uh, neck shape isn't so much an issue for a feel as fret location. So if the 12th fret isn't where I under my nose, I never feel comfortable uh, with the guitar. What's your one thing that makes you makes or breaks it? For me, there's a couple things. So so I the neck feel is everything to me. Um, to the point where good or for good or bad, I have been so consistent over the years with, even though I have different guitars, the necks being so close to the way they feel. When I play a different neck, a thinner neck or a thicker neck, over time I get really, I get pains in my tendons from the positioning being different. And obviously that's getting older, that adds to the problem. But then of course, just, you know, all your muscle memory that you have, that you've been building up your whole life, it's just I've thrown out the window because you're playing a neck's too thin or too thick. I don't like uh, fretboards that aren't rolled. I don't like it when it's sharp and cutting into my uh, my hand. Uh, I don't like the feel of that. So I like more of a broken in traditional kind of feeling neck. You know, I've said this before. I love Fender Strats. Part of that is I just like the Strat neck feel. I just like that feel. That's kind of my, you know, a broken Strat neck just has a great feel to it. Um, Gibsons are too, are too problematic for me. They're too problematic. I have Gibsons I love, but it's um, hard for me to recommend them because it, I feel like you could play 50 different Gibsons and get at least 30 different neck feels on the same guitars. It's kind of crazy. They seem to be all over the place. So, um, that's something that you have to think about, but yes, if you can avoid having super hard preferences to things on guitar, I highly recommend it. You'll be a happier person. I, I've told you this before. I have a friend who's hardcore focused on jumbo fretwire. He's got to have jumbo. So if he buys a guitar, it's got to be refretted immediately, jumbo fretwire. And uh, although I understand that, it, that's an expensive thing to have to do to all your guitars. Um, a Jeremy, a different Jeremy, <laughs> this is a Jeremy, but a different one, says, new guitar week, got a Schecter C1 classic. This makes my fourth guitar I've gotten with uh, the Vine of Life. Oh, do I have a problem? Uh, hold on. We'll come back to that. Are there any cosmetic things that draw you to a guitar? Enjoy a few gallons of gas on me. Yes. A few gallons of gas. You know what I was thinking about with a gallon of gas? Tell me, tell me if you guys think how you do this. You know, I work from home, so I don't commute. So I'm not feeling a lot of the gas pressure that some people are work. Like my father-in-law, he drives, um, 
he he lives like 35, 40 minutes outside of Albuquerque. He has to drive in Albuquerque every day. So he's not driving his diesel truck. He's driving my mother-in-law's Honda Accord, obviously, because um, diesel went up so much. And it's obviously a big truck, and he's just driving it to work. And uh, I was like, you think there's got to be a way that as people we could support each other? It'd be nice. Like, I would love to, like, pay buy somebody a tank of gas. You know what I mean? I was at the gas station. And I was filling up my wife's car and I was thinking, yeah, like, how do you do that? Like, have you ever done it in a drive-thru? Like, I've done it in a drive-thru at a restaurant where you're at the drive-thru and you're like, I want to buy the people behind me's meal. You know, you're in that mood. And so I've had it actually every time so I, so I don't come off like, I'm such a good person. Every time it was because somebody did it to me. I was in, I go to pay for my drive-thru. It's happened to me like twice in my life. I go to pay the drive-thru and like somebody, the people in front of you paid. And I'm like, oh, well then I'll pay the people behind me. <laughs> right. But I was like, why can't we do that for gas? But I was like, I was at the gas station. I was thinking like, how do you do that? Can I walk in and buy a gas card and tell the attendant, like next person that comes in to buy a tank of gas, I bought him a tank of gas. Cause I was thinking like, wouldn't that be cool if all these people that are working from home, I mean, what would it really cost me? One, two tank. I would love to do that. One or two tanks of gas a month. Like I donate like a, you know, a tank, two tanks of gas to somebody who's driving their ass off all the time. I just don't know how to how do you, how do you do that? So anyone have a suggestion? Send that to me. Um, I'd love to figure that out. I've been thinking about it because it just I think it would make somebody's day. You know, right now getting a free tank of gas. Gas is such a emotional thing. It's just not only does it physically financially hurt you, it's just emotionally, uh, it's just a thing that gets you all worked up and sucks. So that's my guitars again. <laughs> so uh, back to the Vinyl Life. Uh, that's. Do you have a problem because you keep buying Vinyl Life guitars? No. Do you have a problem because you bought four guitars? No. I don't think problem is the right word, <laughs> right? You know, problems are like um, those. Those are not problems. Those are you're enjoying yourself, and as long as you can afford to do so, uh, you know, enjoy yourself. The reality is this: you have to, you have to find ways to, um, to find joy. I'm not saying buying stuff should give you joy. That's not the best outcome, hopefully. But hopefully the things you buy, those things do give me give you joy. They give me joy. Like I said, playing guitar gives me joy. Do I need to buy a new guitar for joy? I don't, but I do need a guitar, <laughs> like at least one to play the music. So uh, hopefully you're playing the music and you're enjoying it as well. Uh, back to the other thing, uh, which is, is there any cosmetic things that draw you to a guitar? Um, that's a really interesting question because... I'm so utilitarian with guitars. Like, like I said, I don't do flame tops a lot of times. I'm trying to think of like what I think the prettiest guitar is. I think, you know, what's funny is the only thing I could tell you is really dramatic paint jobs, metallic paint jobs. I told you, I have a lot of them. If you look at my collection of guitars, it's like gold, that lime margarita finish. I have, you know, metallic red, the metallic blue. I like metallic finishes. I don't know what that is. Um, maybe, Maybe it's uh, like cars too, by the way. I've never owned a car with like a nice metallic finish on it. All my cars have been just like white or, well, silver, but never the really cool colors. So I think I, I look at that stuff and I think of that as more expensive, like an option on your car when you buy it. So maybe that's what it is with guitars. I think of that as a more expensive option. So, so I don't know. All right. We have Gil who says, wait, nope, sorry. We need to get to Chad. Chad says, Phil, what shelving did you use for the amps behind you? This is the IKEA garage system that's in the closet. Um, that it, And it comes, I think you can get each one. This is three of them. They were a lot less expensive when I when I bought them. <laughs> I uh, Somebody sent me an email and we sent the link so that they would have it to IKEA. But if you go to IKEA, you got to go to IKEA and type in garage shelves and this will come up because it's made for the garage. But it's... Um, it's kind of, here's what's cool about it. It's kind of not built very strong. Like I wouldn't really recommend it too much for your garage because the ones I use are from Costco and they're heavy, really heavy and built really well. Like I trust them when I'm putting, because I put tools, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> putting really wet, heavy stuff in my garage on those shelves. And uh, I, I trust them. I don't know if I trust this, but I love it for the amps and stuff. Cause again, it's built well, but you know, uh, and the fact it's lighter made it easier, but that's what it is. Gil M says, best washes to Mrs. McKnight. Have a claw on me. Oh, the white claws. I think she does. I know she does. The other ones. They're not white claws because they're the other ones. There's probably so many other ones now. I don't know what they're called. 
but they are the other ones. Uh, Matthew says, happy birthday to Mrs. McKnight. Oh, this is cool. I don't have to tell her all this stuff. It's my mom's birthday too. Just got home from talk, uh, taking her out. Hope you have a wonderful dinner. I think we will. I think I'm going to get shrimp. <laughs> I should share that with you. Um, okay. How are we doing? Oh, we're doing good. Rick said, nice to catch one of these live, Phil. Thanks for your service. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Truly's. Thank you, this guy. It's truly. Yes. Although since I've discovered wine, <laughs> uh, she she loves it because now she can drink wine because she can open a bottle and we can share the bottle um, of wine. I like red. She's not a big red fan. She likes white. I like both. I've uh, But wine is very new for me. <laughs> uh, I think I told you this. Um, for Christmas, Larry DiMargio, I'm um, just telling you for reference, he's uh, sent me a beautiful charcuterie board. And this, apparently what I didn't know, I, I'm going to share this story with you because it's kind of funny because I might actually clip this and send it to Larry. He sent me a very expensive bottle of wine. Now, I'm going to tell you this because I have no concept of anything. Okay. <laughs> I have no concept. Like I've never tried, I never drank wine in my entire life until December of this year. When I say never, I mean, maybe I want to sip something for my wife, but everything would have been like a, yeah, that's whatever that is. And I hand it back. Like I've never had anything. And so my wife, believe it or not, when COVID happened in 2020, she went to Napa Valley with her mother and cousin and her uh, aunt. And it was a big deal. And if COVID happened, they had to come home early. I know because they had to take a, a like a last minute flight to get out of California because they were shutting everything down. So anyway, she went to this event or, you know, not an event. She went to the Napa Valley and she did wine tasting and stuff. So Larry sends this bottle of wine and we know it's on Saturday. We're going to have these cheeses and all this stuff is from Italy. And it's just amazing. There's all these cheeses and these uh, sausages and all this stuff and, uh, you know, crazy stuff. Right. And, uh, and this bottle of wine and my wife goes, well, you got to try the bottle of wine. I go, I don't drink wine. <laughs> so, uh, she goes, well, you know, Larry sent it. And I said, okay, yes, let's do it. So we open the bottle of wine. We let it breathe for 30 minutes. She puts the uh, I don't know what it's called. I want to say atomizer, but that's not what it's called. Anyways, um, she, so, um, so she puts it on the thing and, uh, Ralph is there. Right. And she tells us that you're supposed to like taste the wine, you smell it, then you taste it and you got to taste it for like, I don't know, the count of three or something. I don't remember. She told us what to do. And I loved it. And so me and Ralph are like, this is great. So this is why the story is funny. I have no idea what wine costs. Okay. So we drink this wine, uh, that day, all three of us, and it was a beautiful day. And me and Ralph decide, Ralph and I decide, this is amazing. We're going to get this wine. So we take the bottle, we, you know, we Google it and we find another bottle of it and we, uh, go get it. <laughs> right. When I say go get it, my son had to drive us. Right. So he drives us to the store and we get it. And, uh, we didn't open it that night. We just wanted it for like next weekend. And it was 70 dollars. Okay. And my wife's like, that's expensive wine. And I go, that is like, that is, I, I always like, I, I don't know. I see the movies. Like what wine is like 300 bucks. I thought like, Oh, you get a bottle of wine like once a year and it's like $300. I had no concept. So the reason why I want to tell you this story is because as amazing as that wine is, and I love it. My wife's like, yeah, you cannot buy that wine. <laughs> She's like, you can't buy $70 a bottle of wine, drink that a week. That's insane. And I go, okay, yes, this is this is true. She's telling Ralph and I. So I said, well, where do we get wine? So my wife took me to the Costco, and we got a bottle of wine at Costco. It was $7. And I go, I can't drink $7 wine. Like, I was insulted, by the way. I was insulted. How dare someone make me drink? $7? I have 10% of the good wine. This is going to be horrible. By the way, $7 wine is amazing. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I know it's at Costco and it's $7. It's $10 if you don't get it at Costco. Aerator, by the way, thank you. Uh, Beast Rich 581. It's an aerator and it does help. It does help. Um, and um, and uh, so the this long story is, what I learned is now you can buy seven bottles of wine for the price of the one bottle. And But the Larry's wine was better. But $7 bottle of wine. I don't know why I'd share that. I just like to share that because... Uh, uh, Brian says $7 wine will melt your liver. Well, you know, uh, here's the deal. Um, 
I don't know. I don't know. I just know I got a $7 bottle of wine and a $70 bottle of wine downstairs. This guy says he's got a real question. He says Fender or GNL. Fender or GNL? I like GNL more than Fender, but Fender is. This is why I got to give you the caveat, man. I like GNL more than Fender. I think the quality is better than Fender on average. I think the cool factor of it is cooler, in my opinion. It's just me. I like some of the features they have. I like a lot of things about GNL. Fender's resale value and is just, you know, so that's just the thing. I'm just giving you the two options. Me, I like GNL, but Fender's got a lot of positives. I'm sorry. Chris says, I don't like wine or coffee. And then he says, people call me strange. I'm okay with it. Well, think about this. Up until December, I didn't like wine either. I do love coffee, though. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know what the... Sean, Sean Schroeder put this, and I'll, I'll go to the next subject after this. He says Thunderbird. I don't know what that is. But I know that if you say Thunderbird wine, that means something bad, right? Like that's a cheap, cheap wine. Like that's like bad, right? So who knows? Okay. So it's a, it's a guitar channel. Let's finish up with some guitar stuff. All right. We have more guitar stuff. Fernando says, hey, Phil, where did you get your shelf? I thought we did that. Oh, yeah. So Chad asked me to. Ikea, Fernando. It's the same same thing. So let's find, since what's great is we, let's find some. So no more super chats. Fernando was the last super chat. So that way I can spend some more time in the on the main page. I'm sorry, guys. I have all this electroharmonic stuff up. up. You guys are talking about so much coffee. I don't know how to. I'm going to look for guitar stuff. Okay. <laughs> this is definitely becoming the coffee channel real fast. Okay. Uh, Mental Arts says, thoughts on high watt amps? I've played a few. I've always liked the ones I've played. You know, I, like I said, I'm into that style. I like the British sounding amps. I really like anything that's kind of like, you know, the Marshall vibe and all the iterations of that kind of stuff. I like it. Uh, Dr. Kyle says, you have $1,000 electric guitar. What would you buy? That's tough right now because I feel like, I feel like $1,000 used to be my spot. Like for me, for years, you know what I mean? I'd find a guitar and every dollar under a thousand dollars, I feel like I was really coming out ahead. I was like, oh, I got this guitar for 700 bucks. This is great, right? Like that was just thousand dollars was kind of like, I bought a really nice, like American Strat, thousand bucks. Um, but now I feel like, man, every time I'm looking at something, um, <laughs> it's a thousand, it's a thousand dollars is just like, oh, wow, I was, you know, you're in shock. Like I said, I'm still adjusting. I think a lot of us are still adjusting to the inflation feel of this you know you're looking online and you're like some of the stuff it's like wow wasn't it half that just last year um so uh that's tough a thousand dollars right now i i without looking i'm like if i had a thousand dollars and you told me to look for a guitar i'd probably look for a used s2 maybe a godin if i can find one for go 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 dan if i could find one of those um for the price i mean that's kind of like thing, I think you still find a couple S twos for the right price. Even use Kiesels, man. They're inched up, way over a thousand. Yeah, Richard's saying the same thing as me. Used, shop around. You know, I I find I just what I do is I I just exactly that. I shop around on Reverb and look, try to find somebody. You know what I mean? Uh, find a good deal.
Okay. Um, this is interesting. Uh, somebody's question was, what's a good alternative to a hardtail strat? Well, I mean, you don't have to have a hardtail strat. You can block the tremolo of a strat. I mean, if you really need it to like be like a hardtail strat, you can essentially put, uh, foam, you know, cause you gotta, still gotta stop the springs from vibrating. It's the springs that are creating this outer, uh, kind of reverby kind of extra spring sound so if you put some you, you you know tighten the springs down so the bridge against the body and then put something in the cavity like a piece of foam or you can use a piece of take a rubber tubing and cut it slid it down the center and then wrap it around each spring uh, that would give you the same effect i wouldn't really need you don't need to do much more than that so Sean's question is, and Sean, I saw, I think I saw your question earlier too. I'm sorry. So this is, I think the same question. He says, does a Gibson acoustic have the same Q QC uh, quality assurance issues as uh, the electrics? But I think earlier I saw something like you were looking at a J45 and a D18 by Martin and the same question. How do I feel about the Gibson acoustic? I haven't put my hands on any of the Gibson acoustics. Um, um, I have heard from my friends in the acoustic communities that Martin's QC issues have also been. Uh, quality or QA issues, uh, quality assurance issues has been uh, not so great as well. So I, I feel like everyone's got issues right now. I mean, I've seen it from PRS. I've seen it from all of them. I mean, some are going to be less than others for sure, but it seems like, you know, I, I, I say this and I, and I say this, um, you know, with caution. So it's just a thought in my head that I'm going to share with you. I would not be shocked if 10 years from now, 10 years, 2032, if we refer to the COVID era of guitars, like, you know how like Gibson and Fender and everybody, especially Gibson has had like, oh, these are the bad eras of the guitars, right? Like these are the New Orleans years were the good years and these are the bad years or the New Orleans year, right? There's all these opinions about when the good years and bad years of a company is. We might be looking back and go, the COVID years were the bad years for guitar companies. You know, like, oh, what year is that? Oh, it's a 2021. Oh, it's a bad year for those guitars. That's kind of my concern. Now, so you know, I've bought guitars, as you know, in this era. I mean, and uh, this Strat is a 2021, right? So, I mean, I did it. And my um, my ES35 is a 2021. So, I mean, I, I'll be there with you guys. <laughs> but I, I kind of feel like saying, you know, that is a possible. Uh, Deanna says, I feel like QC issues are companies rushing product. I believe that to be a wholeheartedly part of the problem. Look, I, I, I do have friends that work for these factories and these manufacturers. They are in this business and they are consistently telling me the same thing. They are working as hard as they can. They are busting their asses. They're pumping out stuff as fast as they can. You know, as, you know, as the company can, you know, as they physically can. And yeah, you know, it's tough. So I would imagine it wears on you. Yeah, Sean says kind of like the 2015 Gibsons. Yeah, like that was a bad year kind of thing. Yep. Oh, so Guitar 1952 said Gibson Acoustics are getting slammed recently. So, yeah, it's tough. It's a tough thing. Uh, somebody says QC could be labor shortages. Yeah, well, we know that's a factor. Like I said, there's, a, there's a, it's a perfect storm of problems. <laughs> it's quality assurance issues. I mean, it's uh, labor issues. It's uh, work overwork issues. It's uh, policies and procedure issues. It's, uh, you know, it's everything. So like I said, that's why I said we might look back and say these were the bad years for these guitars. It doesn't mean, like I said, I'm not saying if you have a guitar from these years that you got to get rid of it now and sell it. I'm not planning to sell mine or do any of that stuff. I'm just saying we might look back and think of it. Because keep in mind, even when we talk about the bad years of the guitars in the past, those guitars still have value. They, it's not like they're really hurting from it. Just people say that about them. So... Lance uh, says, hey, Kemper or Helix? Um, I like the Kemper more, but it's a, again, it's a functionality thing, right? Um, 
I like the knob interfaces. Remember, keep, I've said this before. Axe FX, I think, sounds great. I've had the Axe FX. It's a fantastic sounding product. What I didn't like was the interface learning curve of it. That's not what I, I didn't enjoy it. I feel like it was spending more time figuring anything out than actually doing something with it. Somebody else who's differently minded than me or differently in that in, into that gear may not have that problem. They're going to like my XFX dial in. My buddy Larry Mitchell plays his XFX and it sounds fantastic and he can do it in five seconds. And if I thought I could really kind of hang with it, I kind of could have had him maybe dial my stuff in and then go, okay, I'll just use that. The Helix is what I ended up going to because of that. Helix was to me was a much easier user interface. To me, it was like Helix was like point and shoot camera and just do it. Camper, I think, is even easier than Helix for me, which is now I just turn knobs. <laughs> but admittedly, I need to always kind of clarify on my Helix and on my Kemper, I literally am using like three or four sounds and that's it. Nothing more. That's it. I don't have 50 sounds. I don't have 500 sounds. I'm not doing any of that stuff. I just have a couple sounds. I just use them to, as like I said, it's a tool and it's how I use that tool. So there you go. Oh, you know what I need to do? Okay, let me, all right. Yeah, Sean says, it's kind of funny. Sean says, talking about the Helix, he said he ditched it because he was fiddling with it all day and um, basically not playing. It's kind of where he's getting at with this. And it's funny, I find these modeling units are either a godsend or a curse. They literally, they let you play more music because you're not think, you're not tweaking with pedals and amps all day or you're tweaking with that all day. I, I think that's a that's a simple thing. I, I, when I want to play, just play when I, that's why like, I, I funny, I don't know, we'll end on this. My Princeton, that's kind of like when I have people like drill me down on like, why do you like the Princeton? Is the sound, is that what it is? The sound to me, it just sounds, it's easy for me. I don't know what it is. I plug into that. Like I, like I said, I rarely even plug in a pedal. And if I do, I usually just have a pedal and I'll plug in the Princeton. I'll plug in that. Like for instance, like today it was, I plugged in my Strat into the Princeton. I was playing for about an hour or so, maybe an hour and a half. And I literally was just playing music and stuff I'm working on, ideas in my head, practicing. I mean, it was just a very productive time frame for me. And there's no, even though my Kemper's on, <laughs> actually, I was so, so funny. I, my Kemper's on. I should tell you the reason why it's on is I wasn't actually playing it today, but I turned it on out of nowhere. Cause again, at the end of it, I was playing the, the Princeton before I turned it off. I go, before I turn this off, I should AB the Princeton to the to the camper and see how they sound. And they both sound good. They just sound different. <laughs> so. Okay. All right. A lot of you guys are just basically saying the same thing. You guys got to agree. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. On that note, I think we're going to call it. I think we did a good, we covered a lot of topics today and, uh, and I appreciate everyone for joining me this week. Um, as always, I hope you guys enjoyed the videos this week. We did the one where a viewer sent the Kramer. Wasn't that crazy? That was kind of fun. <laughs> that was definitely a weird thing. I, I, like I said, cause it came from Sweetwater cause it's all Sweetwatered up. And I was like, this is really strange. And then we were discussing it. Um, I didn't put it in the video cause it just didn't occur to me until afterwards. We were like, we should have put it in a part. We were discussing like what to do with this. There's like, it, there's no instructions. Do we review it? Do I, what do I do with it? <laughs> do we just sit on it and wait? And, um, mostly I was just curious. So I go, let's just do it. So we did that. And then of course I released the, the interview with John from seven dust. And, uh, so you guys know in case it, some of you guys enjoyed that video, uh, I didn't say in that video, so I apologize. But if you're curious, uh, John and I, we did the interview 
And then we kind of just talked. So it's an, it was an hour and 40, I think, eight minutes, almost two hours, just like the show. It was two hours of us just talking about all kinds of stuff, even stuff that doesn't even pertain to guitar, I think. Um, so that full version of that interview is on the Film Ignite 2 channel if you want to go check it out. So if you're so inclined, um, the uh, which is probably what we're going to do with all the interviews from now on is put the full raw footage on p channel two and then the edited footage on this channel. Um, because like I said, sometimes, like in that case, it was just, we just started talking. We were talking about cruises and <laughs> shaking hands with people and how you deal with that. And when, when we're going through it, we're like, was that, is that something that pertains to people? I mean, I'm sure you guys don't have to deal with that. We were talking about how, what it's like, uh, in that, in the uh, bonus footage, I should say, what, what, how we both deal with mostly him, of course, cause he's a bona fide rock star, but still, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, I do have to deal with the, some of the same issues as him, which is when we go to the NAMM show, you have hundreds of people that want to shake your hand. And we were talking about how we deal with that. And I don't know if that would be interesting to you guys, um, but I gave him a tip and he, he actually took it and he likes it. So uh, there you go. There. Uh, yeah, Channel 2 is called Raw Dog Feel. Yeah, so yeah, it's just Film Ignite 2. And then the full version, uh, also on the podcast, if you guys listen to the actual podcast platforms, you guys got the full version as well. Yeah, Telly Driver says the full uh, versions are more re revealing. Yeah, that's why I think I want to do that too, um, because of that reason. I think it's just more fun. And then Scott says, how do I find the second channel? Super easy. Just type in Phil McKnight 2, the number two. L literally stole the idea from Rick Beato. <laughs> uh, it was called something else before. And then I saw Rick Beato 2, and I go, ah, I guess that's just easy, right? You just put the name in two. <laughs> so that's what I called it. Uh, so we'll see if that works. And that's the whole point. I want that to be uh, just, you know, more. You know, you put more on that channel. So there you go. All right, guys. As always, thank you so much for your time hanging out with me today. And, I'll, guys, I'll see you next week at the same time, same channel. And uh, you guys have an amazing weekend. And uh, play some guitar. All right, guys. Take it easy. <laughs>